Hi, I'm Gianna. I'm a principal in Toronto at St. Sebastian School in downtown. Hello, my name is uh, Lou Panessa. I'm principal at Father Michael McGivney Catholic Academy, your Catholic District School Board. Hi, I'm Mark Santandria, and I'm the principal at St. Mark's Catholic Elementary School uh, in London. Our learning goals today are, how can we create a school culture that embraces 21st century teaching and learning, allowing greater creativity, flexibility, inclusiveness, and inspiration? Uh, this webinar will examine how school leaders can create a school culture that embraces 21st century teaching and learning. The connections to the Ontario Leadership Framework include uh, encouraging school culture where teaching and learning in the 21st century is collaborative, innovative, and creative within a global context. Learning is deepened through authentic, relevant, and meaningful student inquiry. The principal's new role, taken from Fullen, begins with agent of change, one who moves people and organizations forward under difficult circumstances. Leading learning, one who models learning and shapes the conditions for all to learn, and system player, one who contributes to and benefits from the increased performance of the other schools in the district and of the system as a whole. Uh, we will be considering as a collaborative network of school leaders four essential questions structured so that we can dig deep into our topic tonight. So an overview of these questions, first question, how do you provide PD opportunities that support 21st century teaching and learning in your school communities? Second question, how do you as a system leader tap into the resources of the larger community to support deep learning in your school? What risk might you take to change learning experiences in your community? How do you make the great learning go viral in your school and your global community? We really want you and need you uh, to share your thoughts with us. This, um, uh, this webinar really is intended to be uh, a group conversation. So it's interactive and, and so we need to hear from you. So get ready to participate using the chat feature that will pop up on the chat pod uh, on your screen throughout the course of this webinar. So let's start off with the uh, Minds On activity. So here's our first question for you. What is meant by 21st century competencies? What skills will students need to be successful in an uncertain future? So Mark, how would you much. answer that question? Yeah, I'm just gonna say, uh, now's your chance to type in your chat pod and, and we're gonna uh, look at some of the things that you're saying and we're gonna respond to them and include them as part of this conversation. So Sarah today, one of, the, one of the Go things ahead, that uh, Lou and I were learning about today was something called meta-learning. Uh, so meta-learning was uh, the idea of taking metacognition one step further. What did you think of that, Lou? Uh, you know what, I, I, I thought it was uh, very interesting, very insightful. Uh, I'm looking forward to taking it back to my, my school community and beginning the discussion and seeing how we can implement it uh, at, at, on a school level and in the classroom. Mark, what, what are your ideas? Uh, well, I do really, I, I see a lot of people here talking about critical thinking, uh, collaboration, communication, uh, the four, you know, the four C's, and, and that is uh, problem solving. And those generic skills, I think that uh, really is critical to those, um, uh, to students moving forward. I think something that we should add to the conversation that I don't think we've hit on yet is, is the idea of, of being a good global digital citizen, uh, using technology appropriately, what's an appropriate post, uh, what's an appropriate use of technology, uh, how are we good stewards of, of, of the world and, and of the technology that we're using. So I think that's a really important piece uh, that we should also consider at every age level and grade. And I think the challenge with some of these things is that, um, is that they're a little bit messy. I mean, it's easy to determine whether a child uh, can use the proper punctuation, uh, but it's much more difficult to measure whether a child is creative. Uh, and so sometimes those things, uh, those skills are a little difficult to measure, and I think they can be a little intimidating for teachers. Uh, and it's not easy. There's no standard curriculum for that. Uh, you can't, you, there's no textbook to teach creativity. 
And so it, it kind of requires a step outside of a comfort zone. And uh, sometimes uh, some teachers are, are more comfortable with that than others. Oh, absolutely. You know what? I, I think, you know what, what we're talking about here is a total shift in pedagogy. We're not, we're moving away from content and we really are thinking about skills. I mean, you know, one of, one of my mantras these days is, you know, teach me something I can't Google. Uh, and, and, you know, that kind of disarms people because, you know what, we focus so much on testing knowledge. Uh, we really need to shift towards building and developing uh, skills that, that students are going to need to be successful. I love the idea about diversity. We've been focusing a lot on culturally responsive pedagogy and even culturally responsive pedagogy in math. Stepping out of the comfort zone, the inquiry process, and grit. Grit sounds kind of interesting, uh, uh, Valia. Uh, is there, can you tell us a little bit more about that, maybe? In the meantime, while she's working on that, uh, Ben, I would agree with adaptability, excellent character in our ever-changing world, yes. For sure. Uh, great and interesting one, and I'm glad that uh, Valia brought it up uh, because it's kind of, I think, uh, something we brought in. It's associated a little bit with um, with growth mindset and, um, and and just grit as a characteristic that ultimately determines a, a, a student's success in life. Uh, there's um, there is an educator whose last name is Duckworth. I, I can't remember. Yeah, Duckworth. And uh, there's a, if you, she does a quick little six minute TED talk on, uh, doc, on grit. And if you Google that, it's a great little, um, it's a great little clip. I showed it to my staff actually this week. And it's one of those non kind of non educational factors, uh, but it certainly seems to have a real impact on a child's ultimate success. Awesome. Actually, John has just, uh, has just Googled that for us now, and I think she's going to copy and paste the link uh, right into the chat. So everybody's going to have that later on as a resource. Supporting students in persevering through their learning, acknowledging mistakes, trying again, and finally achieving success. Grit, a character we would love to have all students to have. Yes, I think what you're talking about is, is, is resiliency, building that resiliency. I know sometimes, you know, we talk about uh, the students uh, being enabled, uh, students being coddled too much, um, you know, and that failure sometimes is not a bad thing. And I, and I think I, I would agree with you because, you know, it really does teach students, people to continue. Uh, yeah, uh, Steve Jobs, for example, talked about iterations uh, and, and making things better with each succeeding generation. And I think that is a very important skill or a very important characteristic uh, for students uh, to develop. And I think as teachers, we do have to work on that. So I would agree. Oh, there you go, Car uh, Carol. Thank you so much for the link. That's great to have. The key to success, grit, beautiful. Yeah, so that's another great one, uh, Valia, is the um, is that uh, Edutopia article on uh, two grit. Great, ch great chatting, everyone. That's good. Thank you so much for all those all of, all of that information and for your comments. I think you know what between all of us, it's been a great team effort, and we've done a great job of summarizing that first question. So, Gianna. All right, my takeaway from today is that students need to understand how they learn. This includes having an open to learning stance or a growth mindset. And I've included some of the work that we've done with the growth mindset on the Storify. And uh, my takeaway from this particular question is uh, we need to teach students those skills they need to achieve their goals in the future. They need to be good communicators, critical thinkers, problem solvers, and a response and responsible global minded digital citizens uh, for me students will need the skills of creativity communication collaboration and critical thinking these new four c's will provide students the foundation they need to successfully navigate the complex world that they live in the principal does not lead all instructional learning the principal does work to ensure that intense instructional focus and continuous learning are the core work of the school and does this by being a talent scout social engineer, building a culture for learning, tapping others to co-lead, and while basically being a learner, learning leader for all. Before you, before you are a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is all about growing others. 
Oops, let's go back. So the, uh, I, I, what we need to do as leaders in our schools is we really need to think about some of those competencies that we have within ourselves, some of those traits that we have within ourselves that help us to shift, shift culture, to help us to make change uh, in our communities. So some of them are listed here. First one, challenges the status quo. Second one, builds trust through clear communication and expectations. Third, creates a commonly owned plan for success. Four, focuses on team over self, and I think that's a really important one. Number five, has a sense of urgency for sustainable results. Number six, commits to continuous improvement for self, which is difficult given how busy we are in our roles. Number seven, builds external networks and partnerships. Again, learning is social, so we'd like you to join us both on Twitter and in the chat box. So Ontario Ed Leaders 21C is the hashtag. Please tweet out your thoughts on what it's like to be a principal in the 21st century, or tweet out something about one of the change competencies that spoke to you as a professional. So um, another resource that we thought we'd provide for you, and I know uh, Simon Breakspear certainly has uh, become a, a popular figure here in uh, Ontario education, but he does have a, a number of videos. This one in particular is very good, and it, uh, it talks about what an agile leadership mindset is. Uh, the link is there, and uh, that's what it, it's in Vimeo, and, uh, and you'll be able to see there that's uh, his kind of standard suit. Uh, but his clips tend to be uh, fairly short, uh, but very, uh, very useful. And this is in fact something that um, that uh, I, you can use with staffs, or you can use in a principal learning team. So let's get on to the very first discussion point that we have. We've gone past our minds on. Now we're on to discussion point number one. So get ready. How do you provide professional learning opportunities that support 21st century teaching and learning in your school? So let's hit the chat. So Gianna, what, uh, what, what are some of the things that you're doing at your school? Well, I think one of the major things that we're trying to do is uh, move beyond just learning uh, knowledge to critical thinking, which is really uh, judging, and to creativity, which is creating new product. How about you, Mark? Uh, well, I think one of our challenges, and I'm, I'm sure everyone here tonight will, will know this, is finding that time. Uh, to dedicate um, uh, to those professional learning opportunities. And I know, I see David right away has put up PLCs, and I, and I agree, I think PLCs are, uh, are, are the way to go. Uh, but it's finding those opportunities uh, for you as a principal, for me as a principal, uh, to lead. And uh, social media does offer us some of those opportunities uh, because those conversations can happen kind of all the time. And I think of it more as anywhere, anytime, on-demand professional development. And I encourage my staff uh, to follow uh, to follow me on Twitter, to follow other educators on Twitter, uh, but also uh, to to search out those professional articles. Uh, if you don't have time, it's it's easy to watch a quick video on a topic that's of particular interest to you. I know that I use um, I use weekly updates and other staff communications to provide staff with links to articles and videos uh, and blogs where they can do some of that professional learning. And, uh, and it really is about, uh, yeah, Andre shared this idea and uh, it's great. He initiated something here at our school. He was here last year uh, with his Tech Talk Fridays. And so he sh would share uh, tech ideas with staff during lunch on Fridays. And, uh, and staff would kind of come with their questions and their learning needs uh, ahead of time. And, uh, and Andre, uh, they would work. And it was an informal uh, professional development, but I found it to be very productive and certainly, I know Andre got a lot out of it as well. What about you, Lou? We, uh, you, you know what, we, uh, 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 what we do at my school is, is um, we have workshop Wednesdays and it all started off with a small team. Uh, of, of teachers, uh, my 20 worst, uh, 21 century uh, learning team. So we started off with a small team, and this team was you know, sort of the champions, the, the the pioneers. And then this year, I kind of I built it up. I included more people on the team, right? So every year, my plan is to make the team a little bit bigger, 
I want to build people's competencies. And what's happened uh, it was a, is a wonderful thing because, you know, for PA days, uh, for Workshop Wednesdays, I have teachers teaching teachers and they are working on things as complicated as the inquiry process and shifting pedagogy to, to things that are more, uh, maybe a little bit more common, like how to use Gaffey or how to use Docs in Google uh, to mark assignments, to put, to post uh, to post comments and things like that. Uh, so it's it's been really really wonderful to see that, and and I find that you know teachers are going to respond to other teachers a little bit better than they are to me. Uh, so it's it's been wonderful. So every year I kind of I kind of build the team a little bit bigger. I showcase a, a, a different. Uh, a different tool, a different technology, and uh, and you know, and then we have the quieter sessions where people can ask one on one. That's not even counting the conversations that are happening in department offices between teachers, or in the parking lot, or in the hallways. So it's 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 been great. You know, you start with one teacher at a time, and you build the team. I was just writing about encouraging dissent, to challenging ideas, challenging each other, creating instead of this idea of creating a like-minded institution, create an institution that, where the ideas are flowing back and forth, where we're challenging each other. I was in a meeting uh, just the other day, and one of my teachers came in to challenge me about something. And uh, he did it in a very public way, and I thought, well, way to go. I'm so happy that you felt comfortable enough to come in, enjoy a slice of pizza, and have a conversation. That's how the real learning happens, through that synergy of ideas. Yeah, and I, I think it's great when teachers are comfortable enough to talk to you about what they need and, and what's going on because, I mean, as a leader, then you can respond. You know what you need to do. Right, Mark? Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting uh, because we do want, um, we do want our teachers to, uh, to challenge us just like we want our students to challenge our teachers. And, uh, and, and that's really where it's that cognitive dissonance that uh, the CAS talks about in, in creating that opportunity for learning and creating the demand for new learning there. I think that's absolutely critical. Uh, you know, you talk about modeling the learning. Um, we had uh, a JK teacher, or an FPK teacher here last year uh, who was very, uh, very new to technology. And she arranged for our school to Skype with Commander Chris Hatfield. And so school-wide, we brought Commander Chris uh, into our school gym, and kids each from each class had an opportunity to to, uh, to talk to him about his experience in the space station and, and just all kinds of things. Um, and uh, um, it was an experience that, even though it was really simple tech, showed people that there was this whole different way for kids to learn out there and there was a whole different way for kids to experience school. And I thought that was a very powerful experience. We used Twitter, continued the conversation with him on Twitter, but something so simple uh, as Skyping with another class or FaceTiming with uh, students in other countries can be such a great entry point for teachers, but it does really change the way learning happens at school. Absolutely. And you know what, what I also find is, is, you know what, as a leader myself, it's, it's great for me to be using tech, right? Like, so, uh, you know, I'll use the whiteboard, even though I haven't been in the classroom for a long time now, you know, I want to learn how to use, uh, you know, an interactive whiteboard. Uh, I want to go paperless with our staff meetings, which we have. You know, I said, I said, listen, we're not doing this. If we want the kids to learn, we've got to do it too. So we're paperless in terms of staff meetings, in terms of department meetings and stuff. And, you know, and I kind of show that it's okay if the tech doesn't work. There's always a backup. You can always recover. It's not the end of the world, right? So if they see that, then they're more comfortable using the tech. But on to the takeaway. That's you, Mark. And, uh, you know, change does begin with a culture where everyone is elevated to the status of learner. New technologies allow for professional learning anytime, anywhere. Traditional modes of delivering professional development aren't effective. Social media can be an incredible tool to create learning for staff. My takeaway is focus on inquiries with staff that enable them and their students to respond to the learning both intellectually and emotionally. For example, our community is examining math through the lens of social justice. You can see our journey at Toronto Math for Social Justice. And the takeaway from me, run practical workshops catering to what teachers want to learn. Teachers teaching teachers. Take full advantage of 
conferences, connections to businesses and community partners who are offering training, find every opportunity for staff to learn in any way possible. High performing leaders build teams and delegate work and thereby find time to spend with parents, teachers, students, community members, school system leaders and other leaders inside and outside of education. These networks produce new ideas, practices and materials that can be effectively used to improve results in their own schools. So our second discussion point tonight is how do you as a system leader tap into the resources of the larger community to support deep learning in your school. All right, let's get chatting. Lou, are there ways that you uh, use effectively to tap into resources of the larger community? Well, you know what, it's, it's uh, what, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of something that we're working on now. Uh, we recently put in, we've been re-imaging what the library looks like. I've had this conversation with my librarian. She's wonderful. She's very forward thinking. And you know what? Over the last couple of years, we've started to take the stacks out. I mean, why do we need all these reference books when the sum of all human knowledge is on the internet? And she's got subscriptions to all of these different databases that students have access to. So we've kind of looked at, okay, what's in the library and, and how do we change that physical space? So what we did is we, we have different areas in the room for different types of activity. I put in a collaborative learning commons where students can hook up to a hook their devices up to another device that will display what they're working on in their screen so they can work collaboratively and you know with professional uh, sort of equipment and and what's coming out of all of that is that, that the company that helped us sort of re reimagine our library is going to be running a workshop for us next week uh, where we are going to be visioning what the 21st century classroom looks like uh, you know, what kind of furniture, what's the setup, uh, what is that uh, classroom going to be capable of providing with students uh, so that they can learn. So, uh, you know, I kind of saw that as an opportunity to start a discussion with our teachers uh, about shifting pedagogy. Um, the way I kind of look at it is, is if we can sort of change the environment, then teachers won't have a choice but to change the way that they're teaching. And so this uh, this particular company is sort of giving me that opportunity to get to get the discussion going, working with us to build a pilot classroom. So it's it's been a great partnership. So I see that as a, wow, that just sort of happened and jumping on top of it saying, yes, we can use this to move the, the school and the culture forward. How about you, Mark? Um, I was just going to type in here, we have, um, I'm an elementary school principal and our uh, feeder high school has a robotics program uh, and it's something as simple as that last year they built a robot that won an international competition by throwing a basketball into a hoop. Um, we're bringing that robotics club into our school next week. Those are, are fairly inexpensive resources. Uh, but what a way to get kids interested in something in a maker project or maybe even in, in, to inspire uh, a Google hour uh, in the classroom. And uh, it, it really is, there's a lot of things out in the community uh, that can be free. But for me, it really, videos have become such an incredible way of, uh, of bringing the world into my school community. And, uh, and the experts are there. And they're available for us. And, and I really utilize videos in staff meetings and in, in just weekly and daily communications with staff. Uh, they're fun. It's easier. You, you know, I mean, uh, you can listen to a video even if you're not watching the, uh, the actual person present. You can listen to it while you're doing other things. And you can really maximize some of those ideas. John, I know you do a lot with social media. Yeah, we, we just, uh, we tap into the community using social media. So for example, in our neighborhood right now, they're building or they're trying to build uh, a Davenport diamond, they call it. So if you look up the hashtag Davenport diamond, it's a, it, it's a way of, um, of routing trains over the park, the kids' favorite park. Uh, so basically the kids have seen these signs all over the place. It's options for Davenport and people, and they were wondering why are we, why, why are people interested in this? So they did a whole inquiry, inquiry based on what was interesting in the neighborhood. And it turns out that uh, they didn't like the idea of the bridge over their park either. So they began writing letters, and these are grade two students. Well, somebody found those letters on social media 
brought them to the municipal council and they were actually read um, and the municipal council voted down the whole Metrolinx project. Uh, it is unfortunately a, an Ontario provincial project, so that didn't have much impact, but the kids felt that their persuasive writing was really heard, that their voice was, was heard by a greater audience. So that's celebrate fantastic. their learning. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. So coming, uh, coming to the takeaway for this particular question, in our increasingly connected world, it is important to help staff and students become more comfortable with the apps and the online tools that will enhance their ability to learn and to interact with each other collaboratively. Use social media to bring the resources of the world into your school. Twitter, YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook, and blogs can all bring current trends in educa educational thinking and research right to your laptop. My takeaway is learning is social. Look for opportunities to vi visit other school communities and to learn with educators from other schools. We began inviting other principals and teachers to learn with us. Share ideas on Twitter, blogging, and shared folders. Become the curator of your learning journey. So the principal as agent of change. So we're really looking at these questions through the lens, uh, the uh, full and lens that we, we showed you at the very beginning. So the principal is an agent of change. People will rise to meet seemingly insurmountable obstacles and challenges if they understand the worthiness of the personal sacrifices and effort. Supporting that understanding must be mentors who provide leadership. Without both ingredients, a cause will go unrealized and a mission is likely to fail. Our next uh, discussion point is about being an agent of change. What risk might you take to change learning experiences in your community? And we're going to chat. So Mark, what, what would you say is maybe one of the, the biggest risks that, that you've had to take uh, trying to move your, your school community forward? Um, I, I think one of the biggest risks that I took was to put myself on that same learning journey with them. Uh, yeah. It, it is, um, and to make yourself vulnerable as a school leader. I think sometimes you really feel that you have to have the answers. And, and I've become much more comfortable saying, I don't have the answer, but I'm willing to learn it with you. And, and that, I think, has become good for my staff. I think it's empowering to my staff. Uh, you know, and the other risk is sometimes you have to go out and try things uh, to get, you know, for us, maybe it was Wi-Fi or getting certain devices in your school. Eventually, people will, staff will, will create the demand for things. And, and your board may or may not be, um, uh, you know, at that point yet. And you kind of have to take a risk. You have to be a bit of a maverick and, and step outside and get those devices into your building for your staff and for your kids to use. What about you, yeah. Jana? Well, I totally agree. If you, if, if you don't put yourself in a learning stance, how do you get your teachers to try something new? And how do you get your students to try something new? Uh, you need to have a growth mindset before other people can have a growth mindset. So again, uh, taking that learning stance, being open to new learning, giving it a try. L great learning is messy. It doesn't always work, but it's certainly worth the risk. Yeah, I agree. You know what, for me, I, it was something as simple as, you know, we, we were thinking about, you know, it was the whole idea of access, right? That's a, that's a big thing, right? Those people who have access to technology and those who don't. And so, you know, we, we, we got some Chromebooks and I thought, well, why can't kids sign out a Chromebook during the day? Why, why would I have to be afraid that they might damage it or that they might abuse it or whatever? Like, why can't we give them that responsibility? And so, you know, once we made that leap, uh, you, 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 you just can't imagine where, where it went. I've got students who line up at, at 7.55 in the morning uh, to sign out a Chromebook so that they could use it either for a class or use it for the day. You know, they may not have access to a, a, a device uh, to bring into school, but, you know, we're able to provide them with we're a BYOD uh, a Wi Fi building, and uh, you know, we're able to provide them with a device that's going to enable them, that's going to support them in their learning. So, you know, once we sort of got over that, I know some of my colleagues were like, Well, weren't you, aren't you afraid they're going to break the computer or whatever? And, and I'm like, Well, you know what? It is what it is. As Jana says, learning is messy. You know what? Let's see where this goes. Let's see if the if you know if we can you know we can be successful with this. And I got to tell you, the kids have been wonderful. They've been respectful, uh, and uh, I think we're better off for it. 
You know, Lou, I think that's a great point. I, I know when we bought our first uh, set of 50 devices, we bought um, uh, we bought surfaces, and staff were reluctant to use them because they were concerned that kids were going to break them. Yeah. Um, and 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 I and I just said to a teacher, is that really a good enough reason to deny them this 21st century learning experience? because we're worried they may break the device. I mean, Absolutely. for $300, it's okay. I mean, the, the, the pros outweigh the cons, but I think sometimes people get so afraid that they just dig in and they look for any reason uh, for it not to work. Jack? Yeah, I think you're right. I think we're type A personalities, but we have to remember <laughs> great learning is messy. We need to model risk taking with our staff, allow them to embrace new learning, new technology, celebrate and share the journey, not just the final product. And you know, taking risks really does require a culture of trust. Create trust by joining staff on the learning journey. Let them know that they don't have to be experts, they just need to be willing to learn. And the takeaway from me, investing in and putting technology into the hands of staff and students can be a very expensive risk Providing PD helps to ensure that the tech supports the learning, but there's always that chance that the tech will be damaged, lost, or, or, or worse, misused. But you know what? I think, as Mark points out, the benefits definitely outweigh uh, the, the negatives in, in this respect. So, so uh, this is a quote from George Kuros, and many of you who are on Twitter or have attended our conferences know George. And, and um, he talks about this, the visual in my head is of the old notion of a fish bowl. The fish is limited in growth to the size of a bowl. When the fish is in an open stream, there's much more opportunity for growth based upon the environment. Sometimes the environments we create are the exact reason that great ideas don't spread. So what is, in, what is the environment you create to make great learning go viral? Which brings us to our fourth and final discussion point. How do you make great learning go viral in your school and global community? Start typing. There's typing happening. So, Mark, what uh, what do you typically do? Well, I mean, I think the key really is to share it. Um, yeah. And, and when kids produce relevant products, and I think that's one of the real benefits of technology now, is that kids are producing products that are more relevant to their lives. They're producing PowerPoint presentations. They're producing videos. They're producing uh, online sound bites. Uh, and teachers are doing the same. That's easy to share. Uh, you know, it was difficult to share an essay that a child wrote, or even a poster that's packed in the hallway uh, is certainly visible to the kids that pass by it. But what we can do now with the products that they're producing using these 21st century tools is we can really get out there and we can share it with the world. And I find, I mean myself, and I think we're all this way, when we know that somebody is going to, when we have an authentic audience for our work, it takes the quality of our work up. And uh, when kids know that the videos are posted to the classroom website or they're being tweeted out by the school principal, I think we get a better quality of work because they know somebody's looking at it. Uh, gone are the days of the long 600-page uh, essay that was handed into a teacher who maybe read it and then assessed the mark and gave it back. Our kids now produce things for a global work, for a for a global audience, and uh, and I think it's really changed uh, the way that uh, the way that learning and teaching happen. I I would agree. I think I think what you're talking about is is you know you're making the learning real. It, it's 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 not just something handed in. It's something. It's a blog. It's an advertisement. It's a post on, on a website. Uh, it's it's whatever it is. It's it's not just sort of an essay. It's uh, it's words. It's language that that breathes and it lives and it appeals to a demographic. And and these are all things that our students need to learn. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's important. Sharing between teachers, I think, is very, very important. Uh, I mean, I have to say really quickly, I re I, this summer was a, a year that I purged. I had all of my notes from teaching in the basement. They've been there for a good 12 years. And I said, 
This is finally the day that I decide to purge. And you know what? It was a shame. I couldn't even give the files away. And, you know, at, at some point you think, oh, that was my lesson. And, and, you know, I wish someone would take it. And I think, you know, what's important is, is, is shifting the mindset of I wrote this, so it's mine. It's I wrote this, so it belongs to everybody. And I think, you know, taking uh, advantage of the Internet, uh, various platforms, I think teachers can, can, can use that. I think our students uh, understand that knowledge is something that you build and that you share. Wikis do that for us. There's all kinds of stuff. Uh, I, I think it's important that, that uh, you know, we focus on the sharing and the learning and the, and the building. Uh, Gianna? I agree. Uh, Brian was writing about student voice. I, I totally agree. How do you share student voice with the larger community? Well, you post it online. Post the kids' enthusiasm and them talking about their learning. Parents will go online to see their students, and they will share in the learning if the students are talking about it. Absolutely. Celebrate student voice. Celebrate what they're learning. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're trying to do here is uh, reduce photocopy costs. And I don't know if that's a common theme across schools in the province of Ontario. Uh, and I just posted there, down with paper. Uh, you know, because uh, if, if, you, if you reduce the amount of paper you're using in a school, it means you're increasing other modes of communication, uh, other ways for kids to demonstrate uh, their learning and share their learning. Uh, so, uh, so I love this idea of happy hour, uh, it, uh, you know, and that's a, or, or a genius hour, and that's a great opportunity. Even having classrooms, students cycle through classrooms that are doing really cool things. Having intermediate students present their ideas, their thinking, their projects, their videos, their whatever, to other students or to the school at school assemblies. Uh, these are all really ways uh, to make that learning go viral. Uh, in our in our school, and I mean the Twitter is the global community, so um, uh, I think that's a really simple one. Yeah, and and you know what, and 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 really really we're not at reinventing the wheel here. I mean I'm looking at some of these comments and 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 such, and and what it's making me realize or or or, or formulate in my head is that you know what the ways to make learning go viral, the ways to make uh, schools that much more vibrant are already out there. Think about how marketing happens. You know, the genius bar, I think you mentioned that. Like, just the way some businesses set themselves up to market and promote themselves. I mean, you know what? Those are good lessons to learn and bring into school. Like, why wouldn't you have a genius hour at school where kids can maybe learn a different uh, a technology or how to, how to work a particular uh, online program? And there's a lot of ways, you know, in many ways we can take our lesson from what's out there already and bring it into the school and tailor it uh, for our market. You know, well, Lou, I just, go ahead, sorry, Jen, I just um, there was somebody wrote that, the, I think it was Jennifer just wrote that uh, the, the photocopier was done for a day and a half and it was an absolute disaster in her school. And I think for me, the tipping point will be when it's a bigger disaster that the Wi-Fi is down than that the photocopier is down. I think that's when we'll know we've really achieved that tech balance in our school. When people well, are freaked out because the Wi-Fi is down. Oh, trust me, that's all right. That's a big disaster. If the Wi-Fi goes down, it's it, it there, there's there's a hell to pay in my school. And in fact, actually, I'm struggling with uh, I'm struggling with we don't have enough bandwidth, so it's time to upgrade. Right. Yeah, that's a great tipping point. Yeah. So it's getting there. I love this quote by Alan November, instead of asking students to hand it in, ask them to publish it. Students believe that it is important because it is being shared with a greater audience. Become the chief cheerleader and curator of your school's learning journey. A takeaway from me on this particular point, as a leader, it is important to be well connected to your staff so that you understand what makes them tick. If you can do this, then you will know what you need to do to support good teaching practice. Sometimes it's not the practice itself, but fear that keeps learning from going viral. Help people overcome their fears. And for me, it's just share it. Share everything. Uh, activate the demand for innovative learning. Open the doors and deprivatize teaching and learning. Post pictures, share videos, write blogs. As a principal, model this social approach to learning. Lead by example. 
Today's students are moving beyond the basics and embracing the four C's, super skills for the 21st century, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. Want to draw your attention to the link? I, it, it's, a, it's a great video. And our hope is to have uh, some of these links uh, posted for you after. And we can ask Ben, uh, maybe uh, at the end, Ben, if you could address just how those, uh, um, how participants can access those links, that would be great. So if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So here are some questions for assessment and reflection for each of you. What will you, as a leader, need to do to improve your change competencies? So this is an opportunity for you to reflect on those things that you are going to need to, to, to work on so that you're a more effective change leader in your school or agent of change in your school. Well, I'm learning so much from all of you. So thank you so much. Great ideas. I love the happy hour. There's so many great things yeah, happening. I know. Yeah. So much, so much to learn and so little time to do it all in and and I you know it's it's great I love it um, and if I if I had to work on anything uh, for myself it would be okay which one to work on first what's you know what's the priority and and you know and how do we roll that out even for myself not to mention uh, my school community and learning from all the enthusiasm like to have all of you here learning about 21st century competencies 21st century teaching and learning on a Tuesday at uh, 10 after 5. Unbelievable. Thank you to everybody. And you know what? Uh, Mary said commit to the time. You did. You committed to coming here today to, to share your thoughts. So thank you all very much. Anna says, I will need to work on my technology skills in order to be an effective leader. No. I think you're, you're going to get there. You're yeah. already, you're, you're, you've got that willingness to learn. Put down one device and grab another. That's yeah. what we've been doing. Yeah, that's what we've been doing. Yeah. Encouraging staff, students, and myself. So, Mark, what about you? Yeah, I think I need to take more risks. I think Jennifer said it, and uh, I think sometimes uh, I get scared too, and uh, and I need to find those opportunities to take risks and allow myself to be vulnerable and, and to learn with staff. I do fall back sometimes in that in that habit of feeling like I have to have the answers, and I think one of the things I need to do moving forward is to take more risks. You know, I, I often, for me, a, a metaphor or an, a, an image I have in my head is that is that scene from the Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, you know, where he's being chased out of that nightclub into the car, from the car into a plane, from the plane he jumps out on, a, on, a, on an inflatable raft, from the inflatable raft he ends up on water and then over a waterfalls and, and you know, and it's that whole idea of, you know what, take that leap, take that risk and find the solution as you're going along. Um, I mean, nothing is going to be so catastrophic uh, that, you know, you can't address it or you can't deal with it. And you know what? When people see that you're fallible, but you're still, you've got that resiliency. Remember, we talked about grit at the beginning. When people see that you've got that resiliency to keep at it and keep learning and, and, and you know, making things better, then they're going to, you know, they're going to adopt that kind of an attitude as well, I think. Yeah. What's our next question, Lou? Well, our next question, if Ben would... How will you support your 21st century learning team so that they can help learning go viral? So question number two, how will you support your team so that they can help learning go viral? Well, one of the things that, uh, that I'm doing next week is I'm having our uh, curriculum support teacher uh, who is responsible for technology come into our school and I've booked uh, two supply teachers out of school budget for the day, and they I'm going to I'm going to station that individual in our school library with a number of devices, and uh, and I'm going to offer any staff member uh, who would like to go and learn more the opportunity to do so because I think that's budget money well spent. Um, yep. I know I know our school budgets are limited, um, but uh, I think that's something that will give us some long-term gain really for something that's. You know, really, at the end of the day, not that huge of an expense. Yeah. And I, you know what? I, staff that I value their time, right? Because I'm not asking them to do it on their own, even though they will. If they're engaged with it, they're going to take it home. The beauty of a portable device is that it could go anywhere with you. 
So even tonight, you'll you'll be dabbing some links down in your Google uh, in your in your Google search engine that you'll go back to later. And I think we can do that with staff. We really extend that professional development uh, time and environment. Yeah, no, that's yeah. You're right. You're absolutely right with that. I know from my perspective, it's been you know what uh, uh, making sure that staff has access to technology, making sure that departments have Chromebooks, that they have iPads, uh, making sure that they know how to use the technology and are are comfortable with it, uh, making sure that at PA days we're highlighting different tools, different online. Um, uh, educational uh, software, uh, just making teachers aware of what's out there. Uh, workshop Wednesdays. I mean, it, it's just sort of, you know, the way I keep thinking about it is, okay, if I were in the classroom, what would I need? What would I need? Uh, and what tools do I need? What learning do I need? Uh, what's going to make me feel better uh, about using this? Uh, how do I wrap it around my head? I mean, when I first got a uh, my um, iPad, I thought, well, how do I fit this iPad into my day? Like, how does this work? Uh, how does this online calendar work? Uh, you know, uh, this year we've gone to Gaffey. Uh, so we have all the, the, the full suite of Google apps. Uh, you know, how am I going to fit this into my day? How do, how do I work with this professionally? It's been a learning curve. Uh, so, I mean, I got to remember that my staff is going through the same thing. So I need to provide them with that same, uh, you know, that same kind of support that I would want. Gianna? I would absolutely agree. And I, I think, again, like celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Like, people are on a journey. And if they feel that their journey isn't taking them anywhere, then they might stop. So any little, any little leeway or anything that they might do that is in the positive direction, make sure that you tweet it out, that you, that you say thank you, that you visit their class, that you celebrate it in any possible way. Mark? Yeah, well, I'm just wondering if we have to move to our third question. Oh, we there absolutely is, should. In what way will you use technology to create a learning environment that students will that that will prepare students for the rigors of an uncertain future? So how can you use technology to pr to prepare students for an uncertain future, one where they'll have many jobs? Uh, Off the top of my head, uh, you know, I think of you know, I think of. You know, my son who had to study for a history test, you know, and there's nothing wrong with the, the history test itself or, or how he was taught or anything. But the whole time I kept thinking to myself, okay, well, why does he really need to know uh, these details about the War of 1812? Like, why, did, why does he have to? I mean, he struggles as it is. Why does he have to know that? I mean, for me, I would have preferred if the focus was on teaching him, you know, how to research those details himself how to look at, you know, what's the significance of that historical event? Like looking at it deeper. I mean, to me, it almost seemed like a surface learning of the War of 1812. It didn't learn, it didn't mean anything. And I know that as soon as the test is written and he walks, you know, he puts that pencil down, that's gone. That's gone. That information's yeah. gone, who cares? Okay, I mean, he may remember Laura Secord because she sells chocolate or makes chocolate or something. But aside very from that- Very good chocolate, very good chocolate. Very good yeah, but aside from that, I mean, what is he really learning about the War of 1812 and it's, you know, the, the socioeconomics uh, of it, uh, how it impacts on the, the building of this nation. I mean, those, I think, to me, are more important. So, you know, it, it requires that shift from the content, the dates, the, the who did what and all of this to what does it really mean, okay? And I, and I think that's what we, we really need to work on. That's absolutely true, Carol. I, we can't imagine the amount of information that is at our disposal, or we couldn't have imagined when we were growing up. So how do we teach students to be able to analyze that information, to, to use it in a very, very uh, critical way? I agree. There's a great video uh, uh, out there by Sumara, uh, uh, Sugara Mitra, and he asks the question, is knowing obsolete? And it's a great question, and it might even be an interesting question to ask an intermediate class. Uh, because, the, because of the device that all of our kids have, Lou, you know, your son can have access to any information that he wants about the War of 1812 a whole lot faster than he could access it uh, from memory. Uh, you know, and Sugata Mitra talks about where in your life 
will you ever come uh, to a situation where you absolutely need to recall with pinpoint accuracy the details of the War of 1812? Never. Yeah, exactly. Never. So, uh, so you know, if you can't do, if you can Google it, then really, are we are we really teaching kids uh, anything uh, that they can't do on a device at home? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying that there aren't, you know, uh, you know, uh, instances where you know it's important for people to to learn and to know. I mean, the surgeon that's working on my heart, he better have a pretty good sense of anatomy. I think that would be very cool. But you know what? I would really like him or her to have. Uh, I'd love them to be great problem solvers because maybe my heart doesn't look like your heart. Uh, I want them to be critical thinkers. I want them to be a good team player. Uh, I want them to have all of those things. So, I mean, I think primarily we tend to focus on the content, on the knowledge, but there are so many other things, okay, just as important and in many cases even more important if you've ever been in the hospital and had to go through an operation or anything, you just go, please have a heart, please be human doctor, please care that, you know, that you're looking after me and, you know, in, in that instance, you know, you really start to understand that it's not just about the knowing, it's about all of these other skills and all of these other ways of communicating that's just as important. Yeah. And the compassion. I love that. Yeah. Rick, we don't really need to teach kids how to use technology. They can teach us. I agree with you. We just need to be open to the use of technologies of any kind. It's not the tool, but the result, the learning through flexible presentation and research models. Yeah, fantastic contribution. Mary, we are focusing on student voice, emphasizing, asking questions, solving problems. Students need to move confidently forward, understanding they are capable of finding answers. Technology is a gateway of opportunity. Is there anything in there, Mark, that any of the, the, any of the quotes there that speak to you? Uh, well, you know, really the empathy and compassion. I think John spoke to this. I mean, we're all on a journey, uh, and, and, and we need to be able to recognize that uh, and just like our students, our staff learn differently, and, uh, and and we need to kind of take them where they're at and, and move them along in a, in a gentle and compassionate way. All right. So, uh, again, just to add to some of the resources, hopefully you've picked up tonight, we do have a list of uh, videos uh, for you that came from the uh, teleconference 2014, and there are some there now. Uh, that are posted from the 2015 conference, um, and uh, I do encourage you to take a look at them. And there are there are many videos there that you can use with your staff. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that the next webcast, uh, "Building Teacher Capacity in Technology Enabled Learning and Teaching," is March 8th, 2016. I, I, it won't be this team that's doing that webinar, but I know the team that will uh, pick it up from us uh, after this uh, will do a, an absolutely fantastic job. And those of you who registered, I know, will uh, have a wonderful experience. So thank you very much for being forward thinking. And thanks for everyone for their tweets. I've been retweeting and uh, liking all of your tweets, so thank you. Uh, keep the conversation going at Ontario Ed Leaders, Ontario Ed Leaders 21C. Uh, we will update also the Storify at OntarioEdLeaders.org. Um, there's an important feedback survey, so if you could please take a minute uh, to hit the link and uh, to give us your feedback, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. It's been a great experience. Wonderful meeting you all.